Hi, this is Jackie with Panama Relocation Tours, and thank you for joining us for our Saturday live stream. Today, you're in for a real treat because Michelle is going to share her experiences of driving uh, two women driving to Panama with two dogs. And instead of making the trip as fast as possible, they did a leisurely trip of about eight and a half weeks. I've actually put the description of all the places that they stopped in um, the description of this video, but we'll be talking about that uh, during the live stream. So while we're giving, uh, getting time for more people to come into the live stream, I just want to make a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to uh, thank Debbie Klappa. It says Chuck and Debbie for being our moderators. Uh, she's here every Saturday to moderate these live streams because there's a lot of conversations going on over there and I just don't have, uh, I can't watch everything and do this live stream at the same time. So thank you so much, Debbie. Also for the benefit, for those of you that are coming back, um, we have many people that come here every Saturday when we do a live stream. I even see Monique in London, which there's no way you can drive here from London, Monique, but she's here on the live stream anyway, every single Saturday. So thank you to all of you uh, that have returned. And for those of that are new, also, thank you so much for being here. So just a little bit of background. My name is Jackie Lang. I'm the owner of Panama Relocation Tours. Since 2010, we've been offering all-inclusive six-day, seven-night tours that show you um, all the most popular places to live in Panama. And we also um, teach you how to move to Panama the right way. We also have private tours and we have something called our online Panama relocation guide, which is like a home study course. You can get more details about all of those things on our website, Panama relocation tours. Let me see if I have a banner for that. Uh, yep, yeah, right here, Panama relocation tours.com. That's the banner. Uh, that's our website. So you can get more details over there. So we have a lot of information to cover. Uh, during this live stream, so I want to get started with it right away. So first of all, I'm putting up an image here of the route that our guest, Michelle, took to get to Panama in about eight and a half weeks. So I'm going to bring her on right now. And by the way, Michelle is a little bit camera shy, so she requested that she do her part in audio. And I'll have my video on, but she's going to do her part in um, audio. Um, to talk about her trip to Panama. So, Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So, uh, first of all, Michelle, um, you're, you know, I think you came to Panama on a private tour. Is that right? You did one of our private tours in Boquete. Did you check out some other areas? We did. I checked out uh, a lot of the different areas. I also went on a private tour on um, the Coronado and El Valle area. We've been following your videos for about three years or maybe three and a half years now and visited a mm -hmm. lot of different areas uh, in Panama. And we still hadn't decided, hadn't ruled any areas in or out. So part of the journey was also checking out different climates on the way. Yeah, you know, it, Panama is such a tiny little country, but there's such a variety in you know, you just go five miles down the road and the weather's completely different. Five miles up the road and the weather's completely different. So the only way to find the sweet spot, you can watch all our videos for three years like you did and read all of our information in the online guide or come on a tour. But the only way to really figure out which area is the best one for you is to be boots on the ground and come and see it. So that's exactly what you did. That's what we did, and but the but the dogs didn't, so they got to experience different climates and urban areas and rural areas on the way down to see what might be a good fit for them too, and that had uh, a great effect on where we decided to land in Panama. That's great, yeah, because you know some dogs I see when I go down to David and I see some dogs down in David and their tongues hanging out and they look so hot. And I said, oh, my goodness, I wish they could move up to higher elevation. They'd be a lot more comfortable. But, you know, it is what it is. But, you you know, your fur babies are your babies, and you want them to be comfortable, too. 
Correct. They love the beach, but day in and day out, the, especially one of my dogs, she decided the mountains were for her. So we're living in the mountains and we're visiting the beaches. That's the way to do it. So um, whenever you did, I'm going to check your mic settings again. Okay, good. So whenever, um, so when you were thinking about moving to Panama um, and you ran all the numbers on what it was going to cost to get your dogs here, to get your vehicle here, to get some of your belongings here, um, is, is the, the volume of that amount of money, is that what made you decide to drive to Panama or were you always kind of thinking that, wow, wouldn't it be a great adventure to just drive to Panama? Well, I heard it was dangerous to drive to Panama and I didn't want to put my dogs in cargo. So the idea was possibly to drive to Florida and then share a charter uh, plane down. But the more I looked into it and I uh, joined a Facebook group called uh, Pan, Pan American Travelers Association. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, filled with people that have done the trip, that are currently doing the trip. And I found out a lot of people that were saying it was too dangerous to drive. We're just repeating what other people have said. And like it's probably people that they've never actually done the trip themselves. Exactly. And the biggest regret I saw in Panama uh, Travelers Association was people said they did the trip too fast and they didn't stop to enjoy the journey. So uh, the more I got educated about it, uh, the more it became a, a viable and reasonable plan to just drive. So about a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed a guy that um, lived in Colorado and he couldn't ship his dogs in cargo from Colorado. He was either going to have to drive to Miami or he was going to drive, have to drive to Los Angeles anyway to be able to get his bigger dogs in cargo. And, he, and then he thought, well, you know, what the heck, if I'm going to have to drive that far and then I still got to pay big bucks to get my dog, why not just keep on driving and drive myself? But he did the trip pretty quickly to get here. I think in about a week he got here. But um, you decided to take advantage of this, you know, once in a lifetime road trip to go from the United States to Panama and just take a more leisurely trip. So everybody can see on the screen the route that they took. So where did you leave from, Michelle? And tell so us about your trip. We left from San Diego and we crossed into Mexico uh, in Mexicali, we decided instead of going, you know, over to Texas and then straight down, we were going to check out the beaches of Baja because one of the other things, uh, benefits to the trip was say we get to Panama and then find out, even though we visited several times, it's not right for us. We were checking out plan B, C and D along the way. There you go. So we went down and, uh, we loaded our truck, we put surfboards on the top, as you can see in the picture, and we headed down Baja, and we were going to surf at the beautiful beaches down there. Day 10, I fell and broke my arm. Oh, no. <laughs> That's terrible. So, to add to the adventure, so I drove through... Um, I drove through all these countries with a cast from my shoulder to my hand, uh, big cast and surfboards on the truck just along for the ride did it uh did it make the border people have a little bit more sympathy for you uh one person didn't make me get out of the car at one point, but no yeah, no yeah so but, uh, it, it didn't it didn't really uh other than not being able to surf it did not uh hinder the trip in any way yeah, so um, so you spent um, you spent quite a bit of time in different places in Mexico. Tell us about that trip. Did you ever feel like that you were um, that your safety was an issue? That you were in you know that it was dangerous, like people had said. Um, so tell us about the Mexico part. No, never once. We spent five and a half of the eight and a half weeks in Mexico. And in addition to that other uh, Facebook group I mentioned, there's one called On the Road in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of people traveling around Mexico that are on that group. And occasionally there's issues in parts of Mexico, but the information is really good out there. 
to say, hey, you know, avoid this part of Mexico at this time. That never happened on our trip. There weren't any issues in Mexico anywhere during our trip. So that, that was never a problem. And the State Department of the U.S. also puts out a map of areas they deem of more concern than others so that you can um, choose what you might feel is a safer route through Mexico. Mm -hmm. Did you pretty much stay on the toll roads when you were driving in Mexico? We did. And the main reason for that is the roads are just much nicer. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I've heard um, also. And even, um, you know, the toll roads around the Guadalajara and Guanajuato area, you know, you get off the toll road and it's just um, it, the difference is like night and day. Oh, definitely. There's some really nice uh, toll roads in Mexico, but uh, other than other than the toll roads, you, there's a lot of potholes and missing areas and things. And that's the main reason for not driving at night. It's just there could be animals in the road or potholes. Right. Did you already kind of have it planned where you were going to stop along the way or did you just kind of go with the flow of things? We decided when we started not to decide how quick we were going to go. So we would plan one destination ahead for the most part because the idea was, hey, what if we find a place and we want to stay for a week? Um, we don't want to be rushed to the next destination. So I had a little bit of an idea where places in Mexico I might want to visit. So the route was roughly planned around that. Yeah. Um, so also, um, did you stay at like hotels or Airbnbs or, you know, some people stay at a push so you can pull in um, and close the garage door and everything is safe? We had intended to stay at those, but it was difficult finding the information on which ones were going to be dog friendly. We only wanted to travel maybe five hours a day at the most. So we would get up leisurely, check out of wherever we were, drive to the next destination, uh, get there well before dark. In the beginning, we stayed at, we camped and stayed at a hotel and an Airbnb and glamping. But uh, once I broke my arm, it, it seemed like it was a lot easier to stay at Airbnbs. Yeah, and is that was that so that you could maybe do some cooking or uh, maybe there was a yard for the dog? It was mostly for a yard for the dogs. One of my dogs can be a little bit leash reactive uh, around some of the street dogs. So only having one arm and a, and a large dog that, you know, wanted to fence fight everybody, uh, mm -hmm. it was just easier for us to rent places with yards for them. Right. Um, did you have any trouble finding the next gas station along the way? I'm sure there's probably an app for that, but did you have any trouble with that? There is. We didn't have any trouble. Baja, they're a little bit further between, but once you get uh, onto the mainland, Mexico didn't have any trouble finding gas or a place to stay. So definitely if you you know, were a little braver than us and didn't want to already have your place set for the night, um, you could definitely just probably be a little more carefree than we were. Yeah, so just take a, let me take a quick interruption. My neighbors have a dog and usually the dog is pretty quiet, but there's some stray dog, two stray dogs that are walking by and my neighbor's dog is freaking out because there's a stray dog in the neighborhood. So hopefully that's going to go away pretty soon. So um, so you had, you had to get a health certificate to get your, um, to get your pets. Oh, it's the trash truck is here now too. So <laughs> it's stray dogs and a trash truck. What timing on a, on a Saturday <laughs> at five o'clock. That's crazy. Um, so whenever you had to get the health certificate for your pets, that health certificate is only good for 30 days. And from the United States, it has to be authenticated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and also authenticated by the Panama Consulate. Since your trip lasted more than a month, um, how, did you, how did you handle that? That's an excellent question. 
Uh, so Mexico does not require a health certificate. Mm -hmm. They used to, but they no longer do. So we did not get a health certificate for the dogs in the United States. Okay. We, we did not get a health certificate till we got down to Chiapas in the southern part of Mexico. We got it in order to enter Guatemala. So the mm -hmm. health certificate is good for 30 days in Panama, but it's various days the other countries. I think it's 10 in Guatemala, 10 in El Salvador, Honduras. Nicaragua goes up to 14. I think Costa yeah. Rica is 14 or 15. So if you don't get your health certificate until you're just about to cross into Guatemala, you can get all the way to Panama on one health certificate. And it's a lot cheaper to get it in Mexico. You don't need to get it authenticated. The so vet's cheaper. What did it cost to get the health certificate in Mexico? Ah, uh, boy, I don't, I don't recall. I want to yeah. say it was maybe like $50 a pet. Yeah, probably about $200 in the United States at least. Um, Correct. So, so no, if you're going fast or you're going slow and you're driving through, do not get a health certificate in the United States. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. So what about getting dog food along the way? Did you bring all the, your own dog food or were you able to um, stop at pet supply stores and get the food that you needed for your dogs? We were, our dogs are on Purina Pro Plan. So we were able to get it in the larger cities. Mm -hmm. I think we picked some up in, um, I don't know, outside of Guadalajara. And then we picked up a bag in El Salvador. So we okay. were able to go online easily and find out where we could pick that up. Yeah, a lot of the veterinary offices, um, they sell pet food also, some of the better brands of pet food. So just finding the local vet um, can usually lead you to some of the um, pet food that you're going to need. Correct. So um, going through Mexico, I see that you went to, you know, I've been to Mexico quite a bit, but usually it's like Guadalajara or the Lake Chapala area or San Miguel, Guanajuato, places like that. But you covered Oaxaca and Chiapas. Oh, I've heard, seen so many beautiful pictures about Chiapas. It just looks gorgeous. And I've heard the food in Oaxaca is the best in Mexico. So what was your experience there? Yes, um, Oaxaca, we stayed a little out of town, so I sort of missed out on the Oaxaca cuisine, which was the reason I wanted to go there in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did try to touch on the local cuisines around Puebla and Oaxaca and Chiapas. Ugh, Chiapas is fantastic. If I were to go to Plan B or C, it would be uh, Guatemala or Chiapas. Those were my favorite places along the route. Right. That's another question I was going to ask you is, um, when I talked to the guy that did the road trip a couple of weeks ago, someone asked, you know, were there places along the way that you went to that you wish you would have allowed more time to stay there and explore it a little bit more? Yeah, he liked not, uh, Nicaragua a lot. Mm -hmm. Nicaragua, we found it was a little bit hot for us. We, we kind of sped through Nicaragua and Honduras, but... Uh, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Costa Rica. We really like all of those a lot. Right. I see in one of the pictures you have a tent. Did you so do some tent camping along the way also, or is that just from a previous trip? No, that was that was the trip. Uh, that was in San Ignacio in Baja Sur. We stayed at a okay. campground there, mm -hmm. and then we also camped in Oaxaca. Okay. And in each one of the borders, um, about how long did it take at the border crossing, like from the United States into Mexico, from Mexico into Guatemala, and each one of the different borders, about how long did it take and what were the fees uh, to cross into the border? Mexico was, was uh, quick. Uh, the other borders take around two to four hours. Uh, wow. So we would just allow for it at uh, on those days, we would just plan to stay close to one side or the other of the border and just plan that as part of our five hour driving day. Um, so the, the borders are a little bit of work. You have to 
check out three things mm -hmm. and check in three things. So for example, when we left Mexico into Guatemala, we had to, because we had to get a temporary import permit for the truck right. in Mexico. We had to import the dogs into Mexico. We had to do our FFM, the immigration into Mexico. So when we got to the border at Guatemala, even though we were the only people there, it took two hours because there's just a lot to do. You have to export your vehicle from Mexico, check yourselves out of Mexico, export the dogs out of Mexico, and then you have to import yourself into Guatemala, import the truck into Guatemala, import the dogs into Guatemala. So did, did you have to get automobile insurance in each one of these places also? Some of the countries required it, Mexico, definitely, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. Um, a lot of the fees, most of the fees were um, pretty small. Uh, it cost a little more in Mexico because we were going to be there longer. I think Costa Rica was $12 for insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. El Salvador didn't require it. They, they were all pretty small fees uh, for any of the any of the things you had to do some places you had to pay for a fumigation fee or a scan fee in nicaragua the fees weren't huge the biggest fees were probably the dog fee into panama which you'd be paying also if you flew and right. then maybe, maybe the insurance in mexico um do either are either of you fluent in spanish uh intermediate okay so did you find that at the border crossings that there was usually someone that spoke English that could help or did you have any um, communication problems? Sometimes there were, sometimes they, there weren't. If you speak Spanish to someone who speaks Spanish, they start speaking Spanish at a level you're not accustomed to. And, uh, and really, really fast. Yeah. And I would just explain to them, hey, I'm learning. And, you know, they'd slow it down and simplify it for me. Or they'd just point me in the right direction. One of them drew some pictures of buildings. Go to this building, go to that building, A, B, C, and D. So they were very helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, also at the border, there are uh, helpers that can facilitate um, your crossing uh, for fee that you negotiate with them. Uh, right. If you look ahead and watch videos, you can even watch YouTube videos. It'll show you the buildings you go to and what uh, you can do. If you educate yourself on how to get through the borders, you can typically do them yourself. A couple of them, uh, you kind of want helpers on. Uh, for me, it was Honduras and Nicaragua. Um, the the system is more set up to get you through smoothly if you use the helpers there as quickly as possible now at the border crossings um, i'm assuming that you either got some mexican pesos before you went into mexico or you can go to atm machine right away and uh you know get some pesos quickly to get through mexico um, because mostly you can use a credit card but most places are not going to take U.S. dollars, especially right now, because the exchange rate is like 16 to 1 for pesos. So they don't want dollars uh, because the peso is stro so strong. But when you went into other countries, did you need to get some of their currency to be able to pay for the border and other things? Or did you just rely on credit cards quite a bit? Well, because the fees were small at the borders, you didn't need a lot of money to cross the borders. Uh, and there's money changers at each border. So what I would do is, uh, as I was getting, say I was in Mexico and I had a certain amount of pesos, I would just look up, okay, what's the conversion to the Guatemalan Quetzal? And I would know how much the bank would give me for the pesos. And then the money changer comes up. They offer you a lower amount. Show them, show them the screenshot that you took of from the bank and then you agree to a price in in between and it usually costs a, costed me about uh seven to ten dollars at each border to change the money because they have to make a little money too for what they're doing right well you know even here in panama if you put a foreign uh, debit card into an atm machine to get some cash in u.s dollars it's going to be six dollars and fifty cents 
I think it just, you can only get $250 and it's six fifty. dollars So um, even at the ATM machine, there's going to be a fee for uh, both just using the ATM machine, but also um, any currency exchange as well. So sometimes using somebody that'll do a money exchange might in the end actually work out just fine. It did. And then for larger amounts to use in the country, I would go to the ATM and use a, a Charles Schwab card that would reimburse the fees. Right. Did you, did you like for gasoline for your vehicle and for hotels or Airbnbs? Well, Airbnb, you can use a credit card, but if you stayed in a hotel or for gas stations, did you usually use a credit card for that? I use cash. I, I had read horror stories, whether they're true or not in Mexico about them double charging your car or saying it didn't yeah. work. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but I just didn't want to take the chance. So I use cash for all my gasoline. Yeah. When I get gasoline in Mexico, I always pay cash too. And you have to make sure that it's at zero before they start putting gas uh, because sometimes they're going to be charging you for more. So make sure that the numbers are at zero before they start filling you up. So um. I think my biggest concern, if I were to drive, I wouldn't be afraid of my safety, but I'd be con concerned, you know, what if my car breaks down or what if I have a flat tire or what if those kind of things. So I'm sure you thought about that also. And some people are more mechanically inclined than others. I'm not. Um, but did you have like a what if situation if you had some car problems or a flat tire? No, I was just, hoping that I could depend on the kindness of others to help me out. So I have a, one of the reasons I brought the car is it's a well-maintained older, but low mileage vehicle. That's very mechanically sound. So I wasn't at all concerned about that. Unfortunately didn't run into any problems. That's good. That's good. So what was the scariest thing that happened to you on your trip? What would you say was the scariest thing? Oh, wow. Um, I don't, I don't recall being scared at any time. I, I suppose the most, most difficult thing was to navigate was uh, the medical system, you know, breaking my arm and yeah. the, the doctor that I saw said, oh yeah, we're going to do uh, surgery. This was about two in the afternoon. He said, oh, we're going to do surgery tonight at seven. And I said, oh, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to need a second opinion here. Yeah. So then I remember leaving the Airbnb at night, going to my second opinion uh, doctor at six o'clock saying, I, I may be coming home or I may be having surgery. So see you today, see you tomorrow. And I end up just getting a cast. But um, I, that's the only sort of, I suppose that was the most challenging thing. But I got really good care. Uh, did, you need I did you need surgery or they just uh, set it and put a cast on? They just put a cast on. Yeah. I'll, I saw four doctors along the route and they all had different opinions about, you know, how long the cast should be on surgery, no surgery. But I think it was just a matter of different opinions um, about how things should be treated. But I got my cast off in Costa Rica, started physical therapy, ended, you know, continued my physical therapy in Panama, and now I'm good to go. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So if you no, had if you had the trip to do all over again, is there anything that you would do a little bit differently? Uh, no, no. I, uh, I, I guess like my predecessors, I would have taken longer to do it. Right. I, yeah. I just had a great time. I, I hope not to do it again because, uh, you know, the border crossings, they take some effort. But knowing now, if if I didn't know now what I know now before I took the trip, I'd 100% do it again. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I, I pointed out whenever I sent out the email blast about this live stream and also the live stream before is that if you want to bring pets into Panama and you want to bring your vehicle into Panama and you want to bring some of your household goods into Panama, that can add up pretty quickly, you know, to 
um, 10, $20,000. So, and by driving, you can save a lot of money to do accomplish all of those things. It might take a little bit longer, but you can accomplish all those things for a whole lot less money. So even though your trip took a little bit more, what was it, eight and a half weeks that you took to drive to Panama? Yes. Do you have an estimate on about what it cost for that, that trip? I, I don't, other than as a starting point, I took my estimated monthly budget in Panama and decided why not just live on that budget during the trip mm -hmm. so other th so I, I used that as a starting point and tried to find accommodations that were roughly equivalent you know a little more maybe than you know renting a long-term lease uh so other than just my monthly panama visit uh budget plus border fees plus gasoline. Uh, it was roughly the same as, as living in Panama. Yeah. So if you were going to spend like 1500 or $2,000 a month living in Panama, which is kind of an average budget for a lot of people. Um, but you spent that same amount of money doing a two month trip to drive to Panama in the end, you're still way ahead financially compared to what it would cost. Um, to ship your car here, to ship household goods here, and to either charter a jet or um, have your, your pets go in cargo on a commercial flight. So you still came out ahead financially. That's great. Oh, so yeah. Because I would have been living in Panama spending that much a month. So I was just living on the way to Panama spending that much. Right. So one of the things that people need to know if you bring, if you drive a vehicle or if you ship a vehicle into Panama within 30 days, it has to be re-registered as a Panamanian vehicle. And there's people you can get that will help you do that. But at that time, you have to pay some import taxes that are based on the value of your car. So uh, whenever you got your car here, did you just hire someone to help you? with getting it imported or did you handle that part yourself and approximately what were your import fees? Well, I don't know what the fees are yet because I turned the car over on Tuesday to customs uh, and they will be figuring that all out. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, the tax, the tax or the import fees are about 20, 22% on what they say the value is. And, so you can kind of estimate what that they what it might cost based on that. So that's why some people, instead of bringing down this brand new 2024, you know, super fancy fancy vehicle that's going to be have a big tax on it, if you drive down an older vehicle, reliable older vehicle, you can really save a lot of money on those import fees. Correct. Mine's a 2017 with about yeah. 50,000 miles on it. So the Toyota yeah. is going to be forever. Yes. Your, your taxes won't be very much at all then. So we've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, Erica says, um, I drove to Panama, from Panama to the USA in 1999. After Mitch, fun trip, not sure if i do it again. Um, anyway, so I thought it was a question for you. So if anybody has a question for Michelle, you can type that into the uh, chat feature, but you have to put three question marks in front of it so I can quickly identify it um, as a question. So Annie wants to know, what did you do for internet for your trip and how much did it cost? Uh I don't know the exact cost. I want to say it was roughly a dollar a day. Um, I didn't handle that part of it, but it was a data only regional plan and it covered all the countries. Uh, I have an eSIM in my phone and yeah. uh, the company was Airlo, but I, I, I don't know the, the cost. Yeah. So, you know, if you have like T-Mobile, it's going to cover you anywhere. Um, anyway, and that's what you need to do is just check with your cell, cell phone provider and they may have an international plan that would cover all of those countries for both data and calling. Then you can always use your phone as a hotspot if you need to 
along the way. Um, this question, Monique, what did your dogs think of the trip? Were they uh, okay being in the car for so long? They were, I would wear them out when we weren't in the car. We'd try to drive, so you have to check out the Airbnb around, if you have to check out around 11 or 12, you can't check into your next till three. That would be four hours in the middle of the day. That was the hot part. So we'd wear them out in the morning and the evening and they'd just sleep in the car. They're almost six years old. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to go on road trips when they were younger and we'd have to stop every two hours and, you know, wear them out but they did they did pretty good um when we were considering the drive uh that was one of the considerations how would we do with the long road trip so we took a practice run to canada a year and a half prior to see how we would do with a long road trip right and it was successful um, the only issue with the dogs, especially at the border crossing, sometimes it was very hot at the Honduras border crossing. It was 102 degrees. And when you're there for hours, uh, a fan, a shade, is not really sufficient for, at least for my dogs, uh, at 102 degrees. So we would take turns doing business while one person stay in the car with the air conditioning. So I wouldn't recommend this personally for one person to do it with dogs. I think you really need a second person to stay in the car with the dogs because right. some business you have to do away from the car. I, I know there was one uh, lady that commented uh, on one of the posts that she drove to, she did it with three dogs by herself, but it turns mm -hmm. out she was talking about the other Panama. Ah, okay. Um, so, um, I see that on the trip that from Baja over to the mainland, you didn't backtrack and go through, but um, it says, how did you get from Baja to the mainland and what was the cost? I don't recall the cost. Uh, was there a ferry? There's a ferry. So there's two ferry companies. There's Baja Ferries is a passenger ferry and you can drive your car on and then get a cabin and it's set up to be a passenger ferry. Uh, you know, they have lounges and, you know, different comforts. And then there's TMC Ferry, which is the cargo ferry. Uh, no comforts. Uh, if you take your car, you sleep in your car. And it, yeah, you just, that's what we did, surrounded by big rigs. So it's a bunch of 18 wheelers and us and a couple of van lifers on the cargo ferry. And the advantage to that is your dogs can stay in the car. They can walk around the ship as much as it you're able to. Everyone squeezed in pretty tight. But on Baja ferries, you have to put them in a special um, area separated from you in a crate. I think now they do have one boat that has a pet friendly cabin, but I still didn't know how my dogs would do in a cabin for 16 hours. So we went the cargo ferry route. I think it was about four or $500 for the crossing. And how long did that take that ferry? 16 hours. Oh, wow. That's a long trip. Yes. Mm -hmm. so that, that was one of the things we were most concerned about is whether we should attempt that, but it, it went smoothly and, you know, by the next day it's behind you and not so bad. Right. So I'm just going to pop up something here and I'm going to answer it. Um, so Deborah, you said with the residency visa, don't you get a one-time $10,000 discount on the import tax? Um, you do if you have your visa already, but that's only for household goods. It's not for your vehicle. So it's completely different. Um, so we, didn't bring, we didn't bring anything with us that we didn't want to use on the trip. So we didn't want to be overloaded. Right. I, I packed up two uh, pallets to ship, and then we just filled the truck with things we thought we were going to use on the trip since we knew it was going to be a longer trip. And you probably had a great big um, bed area for the dogs to spread out and be comfortable along the way. 
Too, they have right? it's, it's a quad cab. They have the back of the quad cab, and then we put uh-huh. our belongings uh, in the in the back bed with the camper shell on it. So someone asked if you drove on the Pan American Highway from Guadalajara. I don't know which areas are considered the Pan American Highway. There's two routes you can take around Mexico City. Um, but I really wanted to see Guanajuato. So we mm-hmm. went up north and then down along the east side. Yeah, all those beautiful, colorful houses up on, on, on the hillside is just beautiful. Yeah, it is a super cool place to visit. Okay, and another question. Um, since cars made for American market are designed to use ethanol gas, um, will you be able to find ethanol in Panama? Uh, I'm not an expert on gas, but yeah. I, I used 85 in the U.S. and I used 91 in Panama. Yeah, so they don't have ethanol. They don't put ethanol in the gas in Panama, but you can either use a, a 91 or 95 octane uh, gas in Panama. Uh, so what time of the year, what month did you do the trip? And was that a consideration in your planning to avoid holidays or certain weather conditions? I wanted to avoid hurricane season going down Baja and especially crossing the Sia Cortez on a ferry. So it was a consideration. I was going to go before hurricane season hit and I wasn't quite ready getting my house together. So ended up going after hurricane season we prepped the truck by getting uh tinted slightly tinted the windows but got the um the tinting that had uv protection in it Mm -hmm. and i needed new tires so i put um tires that could uh would work for heavy rain and prevent hydroplaning and which is very funny because we had zero rain along the route (laughs) <laughs> and San Diego has been inundated with record rain and flooding. So I have perfect tires for San Diego. So what month did you travel? Or months uh, did you? January and February of this year. Yeah, January and February. So, yep, no, shouldn't have any hurricanes then. And, you know, they've had some along the um, Matsalan and Puerto Vallarta and in that area. They've had some. Um, pretty bad hurricanes the last couple of years. So it was good to plan it when it wasn't going to be hurricane season. Yeah. So, yes, we did take that into consideration. And we just uh, looked ahead about when any holidays hit. I don't recall running into any holidays. Mm -hmm. So once again, if anybody has a question for Michelle, you need to type Um, your question into the chat window and put three question marks in front of it. Um, So someone asked, uh, what part of Panama did you land in? Alto Baquete. It's fabulous here. The weather is in the low 80s in the daytime and high 60s at night. We have a nice breeze and easy access to Baquete full of wonderful activities and restaurants. Okay. Um, Yeah, and also you're close to, not that far from David, where it's got two big malls and shopping centers and hospitals and an airport that can get you back to Panama City if you wanna go to Panama City for anything. So um, I live in Alto Boquete also, and it's a great location, except when the trash truck is coming by and stray dogs and everybody starts barking, but normally it's quiet like it is right now. It's a very peaceful place to live. Yeah. Yeah. And we are, my tires even miss the recent rains because I drove to Panama city to meet some friends who were on a coming on a cruise through the canal. And so we got away to the beach for a few days. And uh, so my tires are still missing the rain. Yeah. So um, someone asked, and we've already answered this question. She said, third time asking, what was the total cost of the trip approximately? Um, Michelle said that she estimated what her budget was going to be in Boquete, which would be like 1500 2000 
and she spent that much per month during her trip. So it was two month trips. So you can add 2000 plus 2000 would put it at about $4,000, maybe $5,000 for the trip. Correct. And again, I put it back at zero because I would have spent that money living in Panama. Mm -hmm. So what information sources did you find best for planning your trip? You mentioned the uh, Pan American Travel Association was one. Um, is, that, is that a Facebook group or a website? Facebook group, Pan American Travelers Association. Uh, the other Facebook group is On the Road in Mexico. And a third really good resource is uh, an app called iOverlander. And people will post on there. Uh, we used it most for border crossings. You could see somebody would write, you know, the different fees and what their experience was crossing the border. And they'll also show where gas stations are and hotels and campgrounds, anything that, that you'd need along your route. People will post where they are, a little bit about their experience there. And that's what I would say too, if you're going on and you're researching these things, people all have different experiences. You can have a different experience at the border depending on which border agents on duty. So we just took all the information in as people's experiences, but tried to keep an open mind also because everyone uh, that does this trip has their own adventure. Exactly. Um, did you already have a home lined up in Panama when you got there? Um, being in the Panama relocation group has its advantages, uh, especially for networking. So when we were, driving down uh, and in Costa Rica, I WhatsApped one of my buddies who I met previously in Panama City through Panama relocation tours. And uh, he said, hey, uh, oh, you're gonna be down here next week. My neighbor's moving out next week. You want me to put you in touch with the landlord? I said, yes. So it, it just worked out really well, the timing. And I moved in next to my friend. That's perfect. Yeah, you know, that's one of the really good things about the Panama Relocation Tour group. Um, for people who don't know, is we have a private Facebook group where we interact and I share information all the time. Everybody shares information all the time. If I find a good rental, I put it out there. But you can put it out to people that says, you know, hey, I'm moving there. On April the 15th, does anybody know about a good rental? And you're going to get some private messages of people that know about something um, that you're renting directly from the owner. So we all help each other. You know, plus we have our monthly get togethers. It's a good chance to meet the people you've been talking to online for a long time, but you get to meet them in person. To, to answer that question more fully, though, I would say that if that hadn't happened, um, it's easy to find rentals that accept dogs. And our original plan was to continue our trip around Panama, doing, doing things the same way we'd done through the other countries until something just, you know, struck our fancy. But right. it worked out different. So Catherine mentions that you had said that you got your health certificate for the dogs in Mexico just before going into Guatemala. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, reading the rest of the question. So how many days do you have to get a pen? Oh, so yeah. if you do that, uh, your health certificate that you get in Mexico, Guatemala wants it to be within 10 days. Uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, all 10 days. And then it's 14, or I'm sorry, it's 14 once you get to Nicaragua. So if you go through uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras in 10 days, you're good, you're good because it hasn't been 14 days to get right. to Nicaragua. And in Panama, the health certificate can be up to 30 days old um, whenever right. you come into Panama. This whole 10-day thing uh, that we talk about for the health certificate, that's if you're flying commercial. 
either in cabin or in cargo, then the health certificate can't be more than 10 days old. So that's another benefit of driving uh, to Panama is that you have you don't have to um, have that time sensitive situation with the health certificate or not as not as much of a time sensitive situation. Okay. You would have to get to Nicaragua within two weeks and to Panama within 30 days for that to right. work. Right. Another question right. that wasn't asked, but I see come up a lot is about the rabies vaccination and whether it can be a one year or a three year. My dogs have a three year rabies vaccination and they were already a year and a half into that. And that was not a problem. Right. Um, okay, so that that works. And I think every country has different rules about what vac vaccines are needed for your dog. So you definitely need to do some research about that um, also. I mean, it's, you, probably, it's probably on the embassy website for that country. If you get the vaccinations that are required for Panama, that will cover you in all of the other countries. Okay, good. So you said you paid cash for a lot of things. Um, how did you get the cash along the route? Uh, did you use ATMs or you said at the borders there were some money exchanger people, right? ATM. Uh, yes, ATM. Each country we'd go to the ATM and pull out the local currency. And then whatever we had left over when we got to the next border, we would just use the money exchanger to change it into the next currency. Right. Um, so now that you're in Panama, are you uh, uh, getting a pensionado visa? I got my visa um, three years ago. So I already had that and my driver's license and cedula. Um, since I had my visa, I needed to make sure I had my driver's license so that we could still drive when we hit the border of Panama. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a nice feeling to just have that out of the way whenever you already get here. Yes. So um, why did you choose Panama over Costa Rica or any other Latin American destination? The true answer is that, um, we were looking at uh, different places and came to Panama. I liked it. I uh, definitely thought it was a place I could live. It was the time when the friendly nations visa was going to change. So I made my first visit, got home and sudden it was announced suddenly that the friendly nations visa requirements were going to change and they were going to change soon. So, and drastically, yeah. And drastically. So I just decided to to run with that and got a ticket right back to Panama and started the process for the Friendly Nations visa. Um, and uh, that's, <laughs> that's actually how I chose Panama is because yeah. uh, I wanted to get my uh, Friendly Nations visa under the old requirements and there was no reason not to choose Panama over the other countries. Right. Well, the good thing about whenever you get your residency visa in Panama, whether it's pensionado visa or friendly nation visa, there's no requirement to live here. You just have to come back for one day every two years. Um, so, you know, it's an easy visa to just start collecting residency visas um, and you may want to get, um, I've done it, get residency visas for other countries too, because as we all know, things can change pretty quickly. And um, so it's good to have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. Already. <laughs> and so that's why we got our uh, visas, but we decided to live here just because after getting the visas and learning more and more about it, uh, there's just a lot to love about Panama. Right. It's a beautiful country and you don't have to deal with exchange rates. It uses the U.S. dollar, nice weather, friendly people, just uh, so many big pluses about Panama. So um, so it wasn't just you that drove down. Um, there was another woman that was on the trip with you also. Um, and I think that's important. 
I don't know that it would be such a good idea for a woman to drive down by herself. You know, I know people do it probably, but it's good that you had someone else on the trip with you. Like you said, sometimes one of you would have to go to an office at um, the border, but the other person could stay in the car with the dogs instead of having them there all by themselves. So I'm sure that gave you a lot of peace of mind. I think that, uh, yeah, mostly because of the dogs, a second person is needed. I, I wouldn't say that a, a woman couldn't drive by herself. Um, I, I thought about it before doing it and, um, driving to, uh, Panama is just like driving in Panama, except for the distance and the borders. And I just kind of figured, well, women live in all of these countries and they drive around. So exactly. it should be fun. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. You know, and, and it's being smart. Don't be driving when it's 10 o'clock at night. You know, you stop before it gets dark. You stay on the toll roads for the most part. So there's all kinds of things that you can do on a big trip like this to increase the safety um, of, of the, the trip. Yeah, I'm hoping that people don't view it as a crazy, desperate endeavor. It's it's a no. viable, reasonable, and safe option to get to Paris. It's a great adventure is what it was. And like you said, it gave you the chance, since you're going to come to Panama anyway, it gave you the chance to check out a lot of different places of, you know, if if this whole Panama thing doesn't work out or if I decide to, you know, live someplace else for six months, live in Panama for six months, where would that other place be? So that Monique is asking that question. What was your other favorite place or favorite part of the trip? Yeah, it would have to be a, a tie between uh, San Cristobal de las Casas in mm -hmm. Chiapas, Mexico, and Antigua in Guatemala. Right. Uh, if any of you, you know, my daughter-in-law, Mariana, she runs the Mexico Relocation Guide to help people move to Mexico. So if you go to our YouTube channel for Mexico Relocation Guide and search for some videos uh, about those areas in Mexico, and you'll see that it's exquisitely beautiful and you'll understand why um, that would certainly be at the top of my list of places to relocate to also if I were ever going to leave Panama for any reason or even just a nice place to go visit. Uh, definitely. So let me see. Um, do you know the price of flying private from Miami to PTY? I understand it's easier with dogs. Uh, my understanding is it's maybe uh, twenty twenty five thousand dollars, and uh, that that can be split up among families with different dogs. Yeah. So I'm going to do one more question here. Um, Rick says, after driving down, um, is there a nomadic or van life presence around Panama, large, small, or non-existent? Um, pretty much non-existent, I would say. There's maybe a couple of people that do the whole van life thing, but it's not really a thing. Also, there's no, uh, there's a small uh, camp park um, in Boquete, but in the whole country, there's not really RV parks or places and dump stations and things like that. So it's just not really a thing in Panama. Now, other countries in Mexico, it's a big deal in Mexico, but not so much in Panama. So, Michelle, um, any other just last-minute words that you want to share uh, with anybody that might be considering uh, driving down to Panama? Any other words of wisdom or advice that you would share with them? Oh, my gosh, do it. <laughs> <laughs> do it at least consider doing it unless you just really don't want to do it consider it uh, as an option the road goes from there to here and it's it's fun and adventurous and uh it was also uh acclimating i mean i i feel very comfortable in panama after having spent two months in all of the other countries along the way mm -hmm. So, Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your information about driving to Panama. What an amazing adventure that you um, that you all had to drive to Panama. It sounds like so much fun. I'd, I'd do it. 
Um, I don't know that I'd do it by myself, but I would definitely do it. I don't think Buster would like it. He doesn't even like going to the bed in the car, but um, he'd get used to it for sure. That Buster's my cat, by the way. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your information. And I want to thank you, everybody that joined us for this live stream. We had 320 people on the live stream. So there's definitely some interest in driving to Panama. Um, give it a try. You know, do a little bit of research. Get on some of those um, Facebook groups that she mentioned, like the Pan American Travelers Association, Overlander, and some of the other things, and just see what other people have to say about driving um, through uh, Central America and, uh, and Mexico. And whenever you see some of the other comments, that it might give you the courage to do the trip also. So I hope everybody has a really good night. I'm going to take this down. I hope everybody has a really uh, good the rest of your weekend. Happy Easter to everybody. And thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next Saturday for our the Retire in Panama Q&A live stream. It's your chance to ask any questions that you have about moving to and living in Panama, and I'll do my best to answer them. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Michelle. Bye, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you.